I've been given quite a straightforward talk, actually, um, which I'm pleased about, possibilities and pitfalls in diagnosis. So this is mainly a, a descriptive chat, an opening to everyone else, really. Um, there are my disclosures. Obviously, this posterior hip pain is quite complicated. There's difficult anatomy. There's lots of, lots of options and lots of things that can go wrong and give patients an issue, which can be very difficult to unpick. This isn't even an exhaustive list of things that can be an issue, but we'll go, and a lot of them are going to be talked about in more detail later. Um, but I'll go through a few and a few, a few little tests that one should be aware of, um, just trying to unpick the issues. I know this is basic, but always listen to the patient. Quite often they will tell you what the diagnosis is, or at least lead you on the right direction. Um, with posterior hip pain, as will be talked about, there's a, there's a lot of overlay, especially from neurological causes or spinal causes, and we really should bear that in mind. There's a few other things that we need to talk about as well, which I'll go through later, um, which one sometimes in the hip world we don't necessarily spend that much time thinking about. With examination, there's a few other things. I mentioned neurology. You always look at the lumbar spine and pelvic tilt. Um, Trendelenburg test is... Something we were all taught at medical school, but actually, I don't know how many of us still do it. But actually, with posterior hip pain, it's a good source, a good source of information with regards to gluteal medial, gluteus medius uh, function. Range of motion is important, especially the Thomas's test. Um, again, we're all taught to do that. I don't know how many of us still do it. But actually, in, with posterior hip pain, fixed flexion deformity is something we need to bear in mind. Um, straight leg raise in neurology, lumbar spine, all things that we talk about, and posture I'll mention later on. Um, with regards to palpation, obviously, don't forget the SIJ, and I'll talk about that later. Um, palpating piriformis, quite a lot of us will palpate around the trochanteric area, looking at gluteus medius, but obviously if we get a bit further around and a bit deeper, obviously we can get into piriformis, and occasionally you'll find patients that will go, yeah, that's the spot. Just for reference, just these are the normal values, normal values. What is normal? I don't know what normal is anymore. Everyone is different, um, but these are the sort of things we need to bear in mind, and especially what, with regards to hips, internal external rotation. I'm going to talk a little bit later on about femoral version, but uh, yeah, one must, must pay attention to internal external rotation in posterior hip pain. The other thing that may be overlooked is the posture of the patient and where they have a flat back and the tilt of their pelvis. Um, if a patient has a chronically tilted pelvis, they can have um, a hamstring tendinopathy as a result of that. And you can concentrate on the hamstring all you like, but if, you, but if actually the issue is actually trying to sort out their, their pelvic tilt and their lumbar spine, you're on a loser. Um, so do bear that in mind. Um, with regards to specific tests, um, this is obviously Faber. There's a, there's a few. I mentioned the rotational profile, the femoral version. Um, we're yet to properly unpick issue of femoral impingement, but most of us feel that there's a, um, is a big association with increased femoral neck antiversion. Um, and one, you should have a look at that, especially in, flex, in flexion, and see how much internal rotation the patient has, because that may be causing IFI or a posterior rim impingement. Um, straight leg raise, looking for radiculopathy, very important. Um, but the other things, the special tests, which will probably be discussed later, are things like deep gluteal syndrome. Again, it's a, a, something which is yet to be fully defined. It's been discussed a lot. But how Martin described internal rotation with adduction and extension is a good test for this. There are others around. Um, I think Faber in this scenario is quite useful as well because, obviously, again, you can look for um, supposed posterior impingement. But more importantly, from my point of view, sacroiliac joint pain. If you force that knee down, you'll engage the SIJ. I mentioned Thomas's test of fixed flexion, fixed flexion deformity and apprehension test, which I'll talk about on one of the other slides. The one thing I will mention, however, is the header test, which hasn't really been described in the literature, so I'm doing it now, um, which is hip extension, adduction, and external <coughs> rotation. Um, that, this brings the uh, less trochanter up to the issue and will squash the quadratus femoris and I feel is one of a good test, a good baseline test with the patient prone looking for IFI. Um, so I bring that to your attention. Obviously, these are those specific tests. On, on the left, we have the impingement test or flexion, adduction, internal rotation. We're all aware of that. Sometimes that will bring on posterior hip pain, especially with piriformis issues. Um, Faber, obviously, in the middle. But the one on the right is the apprehension test. 
Um, that was initially described to me or explained to me for a test for dysplasia and anterior rim insufficiency, um, where the patient feels they're subluxing out of the front and it could be a sign of labral tear. But at the same time, also looking at the post-external rotation of the hip in, a, in extension is something that's quite useful looking for posterior hip issues as well. So getting on to imaging, um, I'd suggest the weight-bearing AP pelvis is something that always gets forgotten. I think it's extremely important. It's very, extremely important because it also gives you an overview of anatomy and it also gives you a view on the pelvic tilt of that patient. Um, the next step, obviously, MRI. Everyone goes through an MRI, but uh, MRI doesn't diagnose everything, and I'll get on to that. And if you think there's... If you, obviously, all these patients will go through an MRI scanner. If you think at any point there is any sign of any neurological or facet joint issue, just scan the lumbar spine as well. Have a very low threshold for that. Um, CT and motion analysis is also extremely helpful. This is one of the reasons why. This is, this is just a couple of snapshots from a motion analysis report um, demonstrating a femoral neck antiversion at 41 degrees, um, suggesting this patient may be struggling with, uh, with IFI, amongst other things. So with regards to further investigations, I think nerve conduction studies can be helpful, although I see a lot of people with neurological posterior hip pain, neurological compromise, and normal nerve conduction studies. Um, so, don't, so normal nerve conduction studies does, doesn't, it can be helpful, but doesn't necessarily exclude much. Um, so I think SPECT CT is extremely helpful um, if you have it available, and this will pick up occult fractures and sacroiliac joint inflammation, which, you can, which can be um, sometimes missed. Um, if one is struggling, don't blood test an inflammatory screen. screen. Don't forget um, inf uh, infl inflammatory arthropathy as an issue. And if the patient has multiple comorbidities, then image-guided injections can sometimes help unpick what is what. With regards to the pitfalls in diagnosis, I mean, there are loads, obviously, but these are the ones that can be difficult. Hypermobility sometimes just causes pain, as we know, joint pain. Post in treating those patients can be difficult. But obviously, most of the time it is conservative, but one has to bear in mind. Stress fracture, hopefully, would easily would be picked up on an MRI. So sometimes, but again, quite often can be missed, especially with an insidious onset of symptoms. Um, I've mentioned inflammatory arthropathy, but multiple pathologies um, do coexist. A lot of patients have more than one thing going on, and unpicking that can be difficult. And unfortunately, occasionally, you also get patients, again, that as a surgeon, you're, it's very difficult to treat in those with fibromyalgia or chronic regional pain syndrome. The one thing I would always say is don't forget the facets. I've mentioned it before, spec CT is great if you're, if you're struggling to pick up where, what lights up. Um, so that's my one solid piece of advice. So in summary, I think that posterior hip pain is can be difficult to diagnose. Um, obviously, history and examination is crucial, and the thing to remember is that MRI does not diagnose everything. Um, quite often, we have to think outside the box, and hopefully I've sort of outlined that for you. Cheers. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come and share some thoughts with you. Uh, those are my disclosures. So the peritrochanteric space um, is a space between the greater trochanter and the iliotibial band, and it's analogous to the subacromial space in the shoulder. And there are several conditions that affect this space, and the ones that I really want to touch on today are the snapping hip, the gluteal tears, uh, calcific tendinopathies, and, you know, in passing also the trachanteric bursitis. So the iliotibial band snapping um, occurs as it snaps over the greater trochanter and always gives you laterally located symptoms, and it can be visible, it can be palpable, and it can certainly be audible, and it can also be done on demand. And snapping occurs as you take the hip through a flexion extension manoeuvre, and you can see the band snapping over the trochanter, and this is a sort of thing that can be done on demand, and I think you can all see that very clearly, a nice little snapping ITB going over the trochanter. So that's the sort of patient we see in Reading. Um, so the, the ITB is a vertical band of thickening in the lateral part of the fascia lata. It's thickest below us the greater trochanter. It receives insertions from the TFL anteriorly and the glute max posteriorly. And it's been investigated extensively by anatomists over the years. And 
At one stage, it was very much termed Maciat's Band, and some of you may be familiar with that term. But it was Kaplan in the 1950s that really found that this was a unique structure that was found only in humans. And so that's really the thing that separates us from all the other animals, is the fact that we've got an ITB. And the function of this is that it plays a role in stance and monopodal balance. It acts as a flexor, abductor, and medial rotator. And it's been described as the pelvic deltoid because uh, it also helps allow the swinging of the knee uh, with the hip. And so it has an important role in the stability of the knee as well as the hip. And here we can see it as a, as a sort of uh, thickened tendon very close to the greater trochanter. This is a, an arthroscopic picture of a right hip. And you can get those parallel bundles just behind the greater trochanter that form that very large flat tendon. Now, if we move on to the gluteal muscles, um, the rotator cuffs of the hip have um, been described for quite a few years and the effects and, and how they were first identified. And, and then the tendon anatomy uh, in relation to the actual greater trochanter has been very nicely um, sort of emphasized in this paper back in 2005. And it describes how you've got four facets in the greater trochanter, and three of them have very distinct insertions. So the anterior facet really receives the gluteus uh, minimus. The lateral facet has a portion of the gluteus medius. Um, and, and then the, the supraposterior facet receives the, you know, the largest part of the gluteus medius, whereas the posterior facet is really just where the trochanteric bursa sits. And this is one such tear of the gluteus medius that we can see on MRI. Um, we can see some other tears here, and you can see that posterior superior one on the picture on the right, um, and some further imaging there. Now, when it comes to calcific tendinopathy, it doesn't come across very well in MRI, and so sometimes, actually, an ultrasound is a better imaging modality for that, but we'll probably hear more about that later, so I won't dwell on that fact. But you can see here an MRI of a patient with calcific tendinopathy that doesn't really give you very much information. We've already heard from Giles about the examination of um, this part of the hip, so I won't really dwell too much on this. Um, and, and again, the Trendelenburg gait and Trendelenburg sign are important uh, things to look out for, as well as testing for active and against resistance weakness. The OBUS test is another useful test, um, and we do that in a lateral position. And the distinguishing feature here is if you've got the knee extended, it really points to a tightness of the ITB itself, whereas with the knee flexed, it points more to a contracture of the abductors. And this is a picture of us doing an OBUS test. Um, so in terms of treatment for all these conditions, it really is very much sort of non-surgical to start with. And so it's really important to focus on your core, your abductor and gluteal strengthening. Um, it, it's also very important to do your stretches. And, you know, this is the sort of thing that a lot of the athletes need reinforcement with because, you know, certainly I see a lot of runners and a lot of triathletes and most of them have ITB issues. And, you know, they really need to focus very hard on all their stretches. The other thing, of course, is to discourage what I showed you earlier in the video, that voluntary snapping, because that doesn't really do anybody any good at all. You can consider, of course, injections, and you can consider corticosteroid injections or you know, any other form of injection that you might think. Um, and these can either be blinded, so just by finding the area of maximum tenderness, or even ultrasound-guided. The other thing you might want to consider is something like shockwave therapy, and there's been some very good results with that. So surgery really is for that very painful recalcitrant snapping, for large gluteal tears, or for some form of calcific tendinopathy. So that's really what we tend to use it for. And there have been multiple publications on how you do an open iliotibial band release. Victor Eliz Latouri first described an arthroscopic way of doing it, or an endoscopic way of doing it, should I say. But he was very much an outside-in technique, which was then further refined um, a bit later on. And again, this was still an outside-in technique. So my preferred technique for all of these conditions is an all-inside uh, endoscopic technique. And so I have them supine on the um, traction table, the legs abducted and internally rotated, and I use two portals and a 70-degree scope. And I tend to use fluoroscopy with needles to 
sort of optimize my portal placement, I tend to use a proximal and the distal portal initially, and then otherwise I add in other portals as needed, particularly if you're doing a gluteal repair. Now this is us inside the trochanteric bursa. You can see uh, the greater trochanter there. We're looking back within the bursa, and you can see through that little hole, you can see the ITB just sitting there very nicely. Um, the sort of most distal aspect that you want to look at is that gluteal, uh, gluteus maximus tendon, because sometimes you do need to do something about that. So always start by debriding the trochanter. You expose the longitudinal fibers of the ITB. You can then adduct the leg and rotate it so that you can actually get this situation where you can bring the ITB very close to the greater trochanter, and that's as close as you can get to mimicking that uh, ITB snapping. And you can then see that it is tight and you might want to release it. Um, so again, you know, we can just show you that. And what I tend to do is very much just a transverse release of the ITB. And then you can repeat that dynamic assessment again to check for ongoing tightness. And then if necessary, you've got the tendon of glute max there that you can release to make sure that it isn't tight still. So in a recent series, I was able to show an average improvement in the non-arthritic hip score of about 42 for my patients. With gluteal tears, this is the sort of thing you might see when you look inside. And the repair technique has been very nicely sort of outlined by Ben Doom in this paper. And it's all about finding that cuff and bringing it back down. But with gluteus minimus tears, you have to go through an intact gluteus medius to get to that gluteus minimus. So you actually have to cause a bit of harm before you can then do some good and then repair everything on the way out. And what we tend to use are these sort of open architecture anchors, which allow us to do that very well. And so here's a picture of us doing that with a helicoil anchor going in and then the end result. Calcific tendinopathy looks a little bit like this. So you can see the uh, fluoroscopic image there. That's what it looks like when you look inside with an arthroscope. And so we can remove that. Now, like with any surgery, it's really important that after the operation, you have the correct rehabilitation because that's really what's going to give you the good results. So you need good physio, good hydro, Remember your ice packs and analgesia, because that's really the recipe for success. Thank you very much. All right, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Ernest, for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. So we'll dwell a bit on the deep gluteal syndrome, both the concept and how we actually manage this condition uh, in 2017. It's a fairly evolving concept. So again, if you listen to the talk in a year's time, uh, it would have evolved. This is where we work, and uh, these are my disclosures. So if you look at the whole concept of extraarticular hip impingement syndromes, you can divide them into anterior and posterior. And anteriorly, you need to think of the subspinous impingement, the iliosoas impingement, and also pectineofoveal impingement. Posteriorly, which this session is based on, you'd be thinking of ischiofemoral impingement, deep gluteal syndrome, and the ischial tunnel or the hamstring syndrome. Specifically, as far as the deep gluteal syndrome is concerned, the first thing that you need to take away from this lecture is that the nomenclature, nomenclature for this syndrome has changed, and from the piriformis syndrome to the deep gluteal syndrome, because of the progress in terms of understanding the anatomy of this place and also the sciatic nerve kinematics. And in terms of definition, it's essentially pain in the buttock of non-discogenic origin. It's as simple as that. So that's the first thing. Nomenclature has changed. Now, the structures involved in the nerve entrapment of sciatic nerve basically are the piriformis muscle. It could be a fibrous band which could contain blood vessels secondary to trauma, gluteal muscles themselves, the hamstring muscles, the gemelli obturator complex, vascular abnormalities, or even space-occupying lesions like tumors. So all these could actually lead to sciatic nerve entrapment. In a recent uh, systematic review, if you look at the <coughs> causes for deep gluteal syndrome, then about 30% of them were iatrogenic. Piriformis syndrome or the piriformis muscle, about 26%. Trauma, 15%. And non-piriformis muscle pathology, uh, that is hamstring and obturator internus, about 14%. The second thing to look at is the anatomy of the deep gluteal space itself. So posteriorly, you've got the gluteus maximus. Anteriorly, you've got posterior astabular conum, the hip joint capsule and the proximal femur. And laterally, you've got the lip of the linear aspera. 
Medially, you'd have the sacral tuberous ligament and the falciform fascia. <coughs> Superiorly would be the sciatic notch, and inferiorly is the origin of your hamstrings. It's also important to understand the sciatic nerve kinematics, which there's been a lot of research on. So there is significant mobility of the nerve during hip movements, and it can almost move about 28 millimeters during hip flexion. As you flex the knee, the nerve moves posterolateral, and as you extend the knee, it comes back into the tunnel. So that's important to understand. If you pull the nerve, neuropraxia, about 6% strain, that's what it would cause, and about 12% strain would lead to a complete block of the nerve. Now, how do the patients come to the clinic and they present to you? Most of them will have posterior and buttock pain. They'd be unable to sit on the affected side, and they may have some abnormal reflexes, although that's not common, or motor weakness. And they may have a previous history of trauma as well. Two things are important here. You need to ensure that you're not dealing with pain arising from the spine. That needs to be ruled out. And any patients who've got chronic pain issues and need psychological evaluation before you start actually any treatment on them, any surgical intervention on them. Differentials, as we've discussed, would be spine. It could be ischiofemoral impingement, which is pain usually on walking and lateral to the ischial tuberosity, pain arising from the hamstrings or pudendal nerve entrapment itself. Clinical examination, you'd go through the standard clinical examination of the hip joint, which would be done in four stages, uh, walking, standing, lying down, supine, lateral, and prone. You start with the gait, you do your Trendelenburg's test, and you look at the spine, both for alignment and movements, and you rule out scoliosis at the same time. Palpation is key. So sciatic nerve, if you're thinking of that, piriformis syndrome, sciatic notch you need to be thinking of, and palpating there would be quite painful. Lateral to the ischium, you'd be thinking of ischiofemoral impingement. Medial to the ischium, you'd be thinking of pedental nerve entrapment, and the ischium itself would be the hamstrings. So that's the second thing that you need to take from this talk. Palpation is key. I'll repeat again. You go up to the sciatic notch. You're thinking of piriformis and the sciatic nerve entrapment there. Lateral to the tuberosity, you're thinking of ischiofemoral impingement. And medial to the tuberosity, you're thinking of pudental nerve entrapment. Palpation is key. Hamstrings, you'd obviously do the hamstring uh, active test at 30 and 90 degrees. I won't dwell too much on it because there are two talks on this. Specifically for ischiofemoral impingement, the specific test would be passively, you're combining extension, adduction, and external rotation. So what you're trying to do is basically get the lesser trochanter to the ischial tuberosity, decreasing the space, and therefore the patient will have pain once you do that. For deep gluteal syndrome, there are two tests. There's the seated piriformis stretch test. That is passive flexion, adduction with internal rotation. And then you've got the active piriformis test, which is active abduction and external rotation. Now, if you combine the two, there is good evidence to say that there is 91% sensitivity and specificity of 80% for diagnosing this syndrome when you combine these two tests together. <coughs> So in a nutshell, again, this is an important slide. Pudendal nerve entrapment, you're thinking of posterior pain, which is worse on sitting, no night pain. In terms of physical examination, you have medial ischial tenderness. Ischiofemoral impingement would be lateral ischial tenderness. The strike test and ischiofemoral impingement test would be positive. Deep gluteal syndrome, buttock pain, sciatic nerve complaints, sciatic notch tenderness in these patients, and seated and active piriformis stretch test would give you good sensitivity and specificity for diagnosing that. And ischial tunnel syndrome or the hamstring syndrome, you'll have pain increase by flexion of the hip and extension of the knee. And in terms of physical examination, you've got lateral ischial tenderness with the hamstring active test being positive. In terms of investigations, plain radiographs will give you the spatial relationship between the lesser trochanter and the ischium, MRI scan for any edema of the muscle, that is the quadratus femoris belly, in ischiofemoral impingement, 
any vascular abnormalities or space-occupying lesions, and very rarely you would need nerve conduction studies. We did a study to look at uh, the normal ischiofemoral distance uh, on CT scans of about 298 hips, and in essence, you've got about 19 millimeters, which is the normal distance, ischiofemoral, uh, in females, and about 23 millimeters in males. We find the air arthrogram and uh, injection of local anesthetic very helpful in these patients to rule out intraarticular pathology before you embark on any uh, major surgical intervention on posterior hip pain. In terms of management, most of them would settle down with conservative management and image-guided injections with non-steroidals and uh, physiotherapy targeted at piriformis stretches. Failure of conservative measures would lead to surgical intervention, and both open and endoscopic techniques have been described. I won't bore you with the surgical details, but we can do this endoscopically, both performing a trochanteric vasectomy and sciatic nerve neurolysis, uh, and then releasing the piriformis muscle uh, endoscopically. And then, finally, after you've done that, you need good rehab protocol in terms of stretching that piriformis out. Again, uh, Going into the systematic review, which has been recently published, outcomes were positive with an improvement in pain uh, at a mean of about two years, reported in all 28 studies which were in this systematic review, and the incidence of complications was low. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, nomenclature has changed. You need to remember that. That's point number one. It's a rare condition. We've had about 32 patients diagnosed with deep luteal syndrome in the last 10 years, which is a high-volume practice but you need awareness to diagnose this. You need to have a clear algorithm for clinical assessment of these patients, and palpation is the key to your diagnosis. If you need more on this, we published a paper recently which gives you everything about extra-articular hip impingement syndromes. Just one slide on the non-arthroplasty hip registry. If you want the outcomes of all these procedures being done, more than 5,500 procedures, 66 surgeons in the UK, then download your copy free copy from the BHS website. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, thank you. We're gonna talk about uh, posterior hip intervention in this session. Uh, I received some funding and industry sponsorship from GE for some of my work on the imaging of sports injuries at the London 2012 Olympic Games. And uh, what we're gonna to do today, I'm gonna to take you through uh, some case studies and examples of imaging in professional athletes uh, presenting with posterior hip pathology, and then we're gonna talk about posterior hip intervention, including general principles, a few procedural techniques, and what evidence-based medicine has got to say about some of these procedures. So here's an example of a 20-year-old uh, male Olympic sprinter who presented with acute posterior hip and thigh pain while sprinting, and uh, the MRI scan quite clearly shows there's a grade three tear of the biceps femoris muscle uh, with muscular tendinous retraction and hematoma formation at the site of tear. So you can also get uh, pure tendon avulsion injuries, and uh, as you can see in this case, uh, who happens to be a 29-year-old Olympic triathlete, uh, you can see there's partial avulsion of the proximal hamstring tendon attachment to the ischial tuberosity. If you look very closely, the laterally sighted semimembranosus tendon has been completely avulsed, whilst the more medially sighted conjoint tendon of biceps femoris and semitendinosus is intact. So you do have acute muscle and tendon pathologies that can account for uh, uh, acute onset posterior hip and thigh pain in athletes. And we can also get acute on chronic and chronic overuse tendinopathies and uh, inflammatory bursitis, uh, as alluded to by our previous speakers. And this is what it looks like on imaging in this athlete. You can quite clearly see there is soft tissue edema and uh, fluid deep to the proximal iliotibial band adjacent to the gluteus medius and minimus tendons attachment to the greater trochanter. Uh, findings in keeping with inflammatory trochanteric bursitis. Now, those of you who are hawkish eyed would have also spotted that there's edema and fluid around the uh, il uh, iliotibial uh, iliopsoas tendon, keeping with concomitant iliopsoas bursitis. So, one other common cause for uh, acute on chronic and chronic overuse posterior hip pain in athletes is hamstring tendinopathy. We do see them frequently, as seen in this uh, picture, where you can see the hamstring tendons on the left are normal. <laughs> Whilst on the right, you can see there is intertendinous degeneration, as indicated by signal changes. There is some peritendinous soft tissue edema, and there was also evidence of early delamination micro tear of the semimembranous tendon laterally. 
So again, uh, the third subset of categories that can cause posterior hip pathology, uh, you can get uh, ischiofemoral hip impingement as seen in this autistic uh, Olympic level gymnast. You can see quite narrow, marked narrowing of the ischiofemoral canal uh, causing impingement on the quadratus femoris muscle. Other types of impingement we can get, we can get piriformis syndrome. As you can see in this image, there is asymmetry with hypertrophy of the left-sided piriformis muscle compressing the sciatic nerve as it exits the sciatic notch. And of, obviously, there's a lot written about uh, femoral stabler hip impingement syndromes, as you can see in this case, when you have increased antiversion, you can get focal or global overcoverage of the femoral head causing acetabular labral tears and secondary degenerative changes as shown in this hip orthogram image. So let's talk about hip intervention. Uh, it's very commonly performed, and most of these procedures are done under ultrasound because uh, structures are quite easily accessible under ultrasound. Very few CT or X-ray fluoroscopic guided techniques are performed. If you have to name a few, uh, sacral joint injections or lower lumbar spine intervention are usually performed under CT or X-ray fluoroscopy. The general principles of consent and asepsis apply like anywhere else in the body, and you have a wide array of probes, and especially when you're doing your ultrasound, we tend to use the linear uh, tr uh, high-frequency transducers. So let's have a look at some examples. Uh, the most common injection that we get, uh, get asked to perform uh, in both general uh, population as well as athletes is a uh, trochanteric bursal injection. I'm not going to go into the details of anatomy. We know we have two tendinous insertions. The gluteus uh, minimus inserting into the anterior facet, whilst the gluteus medius inserts into the lateral and posterior superior facet. Likewise, we have three different anatomical bursae. We have the subgluteus medius, subgluteus minimus, and then we have the trochanteric bursa posteriorly. And knowledge of this anatomy is important to target the inflamed bursa appropriately. Whilst doing the procedure, patients are made to lie in a lateral decubitus position with the side injecting facing up, and we tend to use a 22 gauge spinal needle because of the length of the needle, it provides easy access to the bursae. As you can see in this image, a uh, needle being introduced into the subgluteus medius uh, bursa before injections being performed. Now, with regards to uh, proximal hamstrings intervention, uh, the key is the positioning of the patient. Now, I've seen people try to access the hamstring tendons on ultrasound in a prone position, but what I find, uh, it can be quite tricky because of the amount of gluteal fat and muscle. The ideal technique is for the patient to lie in a lateral decubitus position with hip and knee flexed, and this provides for easy access to the tendons under ultrasound. And once again, uh, we tend to use a spinal needle uh, to access these tendons before performing the injection. Now, one key important uh, aspect about Hamsing's intervention is the close proximity to the sciatic nerve. And it's important to identify the structure and keep off it because uh, uh, not only can you cause extreme patient discomfort, especially when you're injecting local anesthetic, we can cause uh, transient paralysis of the leg and uh, motor sensory discomfort. So it's important to keep away from the nerve. Now, we did talk about uh, ischiofemoral impingement and uh, preformis syndrome. In order to access these structures, patients are made to lie in a prone position. I find uh, getting access to these structures quite easy when you use a transverse axis from lateral to medial approach. And it's important to identify your bony landmarks. If you're doing ischiofemoral impingement, uh, you look at your, uh, you identify your ischium as well as the lesser trochanter and uh, insert the spinal needle into the quadratus femoris muscle. Likewise, while doing the piriformis muscle, it's important to identify the sciatic notch and the lateral marginal sacrum and uh, inject the piriformis muscle, but again, keep clear of the sciatic nerve, which is a structure deep to it. Now, what kind of medications do we use? Corticosteroids have been around for a long, long time, but still the most commonly used uh, medications uh, today. We use it for active tendinopathy, tenosynovitis, <coughs> inflamed bursitis, and also in degenerate joint disease uh, to alleviate the inflammation within the joint. The mechanism of action is really straightforward. What it does is basically suppresses the inflammation. In essence, it acts as a long-term local anesthetic. So it's, not, uh, it's just reducing the inflammation, but the, offending, uh, the underlying cause has not been taken away. All it does is produce long-term symptom relief. And it's important to also remember that intratendinous injection is contraindicated because of risk of tendon rupture. Now, it becomes more interesting when patients present with chronic tendinopathies. If you look at the pathology in chronic tendinopathy, it's rather than active inflammation, it's chronic tendon degeneration, which is the problem. So repeated corticosteroid injections are not going to make any impact on these patients. Now, what's been shown to work is tendon fenestration or dry needling technique where you, inject, where you insert the needle directly into the affected tendon 
and you inject some local anesthetic per to perform hydro dissection of the tendon fibers before making multiple micropunctures to induce bleeding within the tendon itself. Now, the idea behind this is you're trying to uh, induce inflammation, trigger the inflammatory cascade to promote uh, tissue healing within the tendon. There are several studies out there to prove the efficacy of this procedure. And one study I'd like to quote is from Jacobson uh, et al. from Ann Arbor Institute in Michigan. He looked at uh, dry needling technique and found it to be extremely effective in over 85% of the subjects who had the procedure. Now, a quick look at uh, other uh, injectant substances we tend to use in sport. Autologous whole blood, where we uh, draw blood from the patient and inject it. PRP, where the blood is centrifuged and uh, we tend to inject the platelet rich plasma. And then we also have prolotherapy, where we inject sclerosanct substance, which are usually irritant substances, 10 to 25% dextrose, uh, diluted in uh, normal saline and lidocaine. Now, these have been around for a while, but have come into fashion more recently. Um, after Pittsburgh Steelers' uh, success in Super Bowl uh, in early 2000s. And the mechanism of action is really that they induce the inflammatory cascade to release growth factors and inflammatory mediators to promote collagen synthesis and tissue healing. Their use has been advocated in both acute muscle tendon ligament injuries as well as chronic refractory tendinopathies. But it's important to have a look at the evidence, what, the, uh, what it says. Now, ignore the busy slide. There are a lot of studies out there regarding use of PRP in, in muscle and tendon pathologies, but the problem is they're all contradictory and conflicting. I'd like to quote a few. For example, this uh, study from Hammett and team in uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine showed that PRP is effective, reducing the mean time to return to play in athletes with acute hamstring injury as compared to rehabilitation alone. But the very next year, in 2015, we had a randomized control trial from Hamilton and team, which showed that uh, PRP uh, ha makes no difference with regards to time to return to play uh, compared to intense rehab. So there's, a liter there's literature out there. The problem is we don't have any real consensus regarding the use of PRP in musculoskeletal and sports intervention. The use of prolotherapy has been advocated in chronic tendinopathies, and the evidence is slightly more favorable to this because in prolotherapy, what the sclerosanks do is they not only induce inflammation, they also cause uh, neurolysis and chemoneuromodulation. So in a sense, they can produce uh, symptomatic improvement in chronic tendinopathies. So uh, as discussed in earlier talks, it's important when you don't uh, identify a specific posterior hip pathology, it's important to look at the lumbar spine itself. You can get disc herniations, uh, parse fractures, facet joints and ovule cysts, as you can see in this case, which was in injected with the cyst being ruptured uh, contrast into the spinal epidural space, and also inflammatory causes like uh, sacroiliitis, as you can see in this bilateral sacroiliitis, and infection of the sacroiliac joints as well as stress and insufficiency fractures. I mean, these should be in the back of the mind always when we fail to establish uh, any specific cause of posterior hip pain in sports. So in summary, uh, hopefully over the course of the last 10 minutes, I have taken you through some uh, acute and chronic uh, posterior tendon pathologies, discussed some interventional procedures, and looked at some evidence-based medicine regarding the use of these procedures. So corticosteroids, useful in active inflammation, but not so good when it comes to chronic tendinopathies. Dry needling is more effective for chronic tendinopathies, and we don't have sufficient evidence regarding the use of PRP and whole blood in acute and chronic uh, musculoskeletal and sports injuries, but the evidence is slightly more favorable for use of prolotherapy and chronic tendinopathies, although we need more evidence to prove the efficacy of these treatment regimes. Thank you. Thank you, Ernest, for your invitation, and it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, we are trying to, to talk about uh, surgical management in hamstring injuries. We know that, in general, uh, hamstring injuries, conservative treatment, heal well, but there are some specific injuries that we believe that the surgical management is the best option. We know that hamstring injuries are common in athletes. Uh, in Good in 2004 in British soccer found 15 missed matches and 19 missed training days. And we know that the injury mechanism, it's in general, it's, uh, it's a hip flexion and, and knee extension. Uh, we we have a muscle injury clinical guide. We start in 2007 to write it, and the first was published in 2009. And now we are in the third, in the third uh, edition. 
And we have tried to have a consensus with different muscle group experts about the, 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 the treatment of, of muscle injuries. This is our consensus in hamstring uh, injuries in proximal, when we have a, a biceps femoris long head and semitendinosus, uh, we consider surgical. In semimembranosus, the first option, we, we want to do conservative treatment, and if uh, the, we have problems later, then we consider the surgery. Distally, it's rare, really, and if we have it, then uh, we make a surgical reattach as well. Uh, how we manage muscle injuries, the concept, it's, uh, in our opinion, is the, the, the amount of extracellular matrix damage, and its impact on further regeneration and transmission, it's a, a key factor in the muscle injury clinics and prognosis. We are very close to the British uh, classification with an oil pollock, and, and we use a lot the concept of the site of myofascial, muscular, musculotendinosus, and intratendinosus. In this small space, uh, space uh, we, can, we can find the, the majority of, of, uh, of injuries, and, and, and here, injuries in this level, the majority can, can consider to do surgery. Here we have a sciatic nerve, we have the common tendon of biceps long, long head and semitendinosus, and deeper we have the tendon of semimembranosus. And this is the algorithm uh, about the surgery and the indications. When we have one, two, or three tendon avulsions in professional athletes or other high demand patients, we consider uh, early surgery and uh, Recreational athletes or inactive patients, if one tendon, maybe a conservative treatment is a, one, is a good option, but two tendons and three tendons, we consider uh, that the, the surgery uh, maybe is the, the, best, the best option. Here is a case of a professional athlete, a complete evolution of the three tendons. Here we can see the sticker. Here we can see how we uh, attach the, the tendons with different anchors. This is another severe injury. Here we can see this is the, the tendon of the semimembranosus, the tendon stamp of the biceps femoris. And here is when we have made the reattach and, and the muscles have the tension again. Sometimes in, in chronic injuries, when we open, we don't find nothing. And we can believe that really is not so, so severe, the, the injury. And when you carry on the dissection, you can find this fluid between the tendons, the cavity, and here we can, different, uh, uh, we can, we can see different portions of the, of the injury, and here is uh, the ischium. This is a, a distal injury, it's a professional player. After four months, we, can, we, 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 we weren't be able to return to play. Here you can see the speck, the pale aspect of the muscle at the of the loss of tension of the tendon, it was a semitendinosus. We couldn't reattach distally, and in this case, uh, we did uh, a suture to the semi, uh, semi uh, membranosus tendon to give tension to the muscle. And when we finished the surgery, the aspect of the muscle was really very different. This injuries is the the where we have more problem, more problems. In, in our club in this moment, the central tendon injuries. Central tendon injuries were described. Uh, Jules Comin, that he's, he's telling that they need a long recovery times, they have worse results. Biceps femoris is the most uh, tendon affected, and there is a high rate of recurrent injury. This is the last player we, uh, we did surgery. You see here. May, this is the, the injury. Uh, July, we believe he was healed. Next day, the same injury. What we want to, to, to say with this, this image, that the MRI has no role in the re-injury the re and the return to play. And so it's important to know it, because we don't, we don't have enough with a simple MRI to know if the, 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 the injury is healed. So our experience uh, in that moment, not only in our club, in the group that we are working in professional players, we have now in that moment 
19 patients that they suffered surgery for this kind of, 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 of injuries. The normal, it's re-injuries in three and five episodes, and it's dramatical that a simple injury that maybe with a long time of recovering of two, three months, because probably we're talking about tendon injury, can late five, six, seven months. And that is very difficult to understand for our, our club or, or for all the, the people who's working with a professional athlete. This is the image we can find, the common tendon, central tendon, and all, and in general, we, ha, we can find a cavity here. This is another case that in August 13, five months later, again, the surgery, and here, so, and here we can see sometimes we have a uh, scar tissue over the, the sciatic nerve, we have to release, we have to remove it, and then here we can see the gap. How we treat? Uh, we prefer to use anchors, but other, out, uh, other, uh, other doctors, uh, like uh, uh, Sonori Cotet, decide to remove, to remove and, and to, to, to take it out, the, the, the tendon stump, and to make a suture side to side to the surrender muscles. This is the case that we, we were seeing, and this is the, after one year, the surgery. Really, he has a very good aspect, the MRI. This is another case. You see here the, all the, the scar tissue. Oh, sorry. Here we can see the scar tissue over sciatic nerve after we remove. You will see the cavity and the loss of tension of the biceps femur. Sorry. We make a suture. And, and we give more tension to the biceps, and then we put an anchor to reinforce all the, all the suture. We were looking for, because we check all the professional players in the first team, and we saw that the free tendon that was described in 2013 from five centimeters from the ischium bone, if there was a, a relationship with uh, the, the longitudinal, okay. We didn't find, but in all the players that we have made operation, we find that the, this free tendon is really, really long, sometimes six, seven, even eight centimeters. Uh, so in our experience, the first option in general, it's a long time of a return to play from two uh, ten weeks, and if a, there is a re-injury, we decide to do surgery. In semimembranosus, we, uh, in, initially we, we make uh, uh, conservative treatment, and if uh, we decide to do surgeries, because we find a Hansen syndrome well described by Orava and Puranen, uh, because there is a relationship very close, uh, the semimembranosus asiatic nerve, and, and the anatomy of the semimembranosus is very special with this membrane, a uh, white membrane. And here we can see all scar tissue, and in this case is a hamstring syndrome because it's a tendinopathy of the semimembrane osseous. And here we can see after remove all the scar tissue. And in this case, only we cut the tendon and, and, and partial, not completely, the, the membrane. because it has a really, a, a, was really very tight. Okay, we have a rehabilitation protocol that is very important, but this protocol is not only alone, always goes with a return to play. And the philosophy of return to play, it's, for, uh, it's uh, four aspects. One is uh, injury location, connective tissue, anatomy, anatomical variability, imaging, and the position and GPS. 
This is the, the summary of a, one injury that we start with four, four steps. First step is running and profession and coordination. With, uh, we, we, we work a lot in dry sand. We use the GPS data. This is the second step with the dry with the ball. We use uphill and downhill with a 10% uh, slope. And here, we can see it, but the, all circuits are very short time, 30, 40 minutes. And, and with this kind of, 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 of training, it's enough to get the fit profile of the players because we have the fit profile of the players because we have been recording all the trainings and we know the GPS data to know if we are ready to return to play. In summary, general are managed conservative. This is are the indications of the surgical treatment, total chronic tendinopathies, hamstring syndromes, sciatic nerves, and in central tendon, we have to think a long time on recovering, and if uh, we make surgery, the rehabilitation period, it's approximately three and four months. Thank you very much. Right, I'm gonna talk on conservative management of hamstring injuries, and, and mainly around proximal hamstring injuries, as this is a posterior hip um, session. Uh, no disclosures of interest. So um, I work, this, my, my talk is mainly around my experience with British athletics, where I worked for the last nine years. I'm about to leave them the next couple of weeks um, and, and go um, full-time in football. Um, but this experience is from British athletics, and I've got to thank the whole team, British athletics, who've come up with some of the stuff I'm going to present today. Uh, we did an a injury surveillance uh, report uh, from 2009 to 2013. And in all our athletes, 214 athletes during that time, track and field athletes, uh, we had 475 time loss injuries, of which 24% were hamstring injuries. And that total time loss due to hamstring injuries amounted to 18 years in our athletes. So that's mainly in sprinters and jumpers. And we kind of realized there's a problem and we have to come up with a strategy. We started a strategy four years ago and it's <coughs> ongoing, it's still developing uh, under the guidance of Noel Pollock, who's in the audience today. Uh, the main thing that's come out of this, and I think this is really the linchpin that everything is, um, comes from, is that we came up with a classification that had real meaning to our athletes uh, and, and our management of our athletes. And I'm sure you'll hear this a hundred times uh, during uh, the next couple of days. But the classification basically starts with myofascial or A injuries, where you get uh, an injury uh, to the myofascia, uh, muscular tenderness injuries, and then uh, uh, tenderness or in, um, intramuscular tendon injuries. When you look at those injuries, the healing is quite different, and I think this again gives us some um, uh, background, to, uh, theoretical background to how we would manage them. Uh, myofascial injuries uh, and connective tissue injuries heal through inflammation and fibrosis, and they get some good tensile strength relatively quickly. Muscular tenderness injuries uh, heal through uh, satellite activation and myofibro regeneration. And that uh, is ongoing, um, but takes a lot longer. And then, but the big thing here is our tenderness injuries, or our C injuries, where again, you're talking about connective tissue, but this is connective tissue that is part of that contractile <laughs> element. So you get that inflammation, and you get some weak uh, collagen tissue to start with, which eventually uh, remodels. Uh, but that takes uh, many months uh, to reach uh, pre-injury uh, levels. So return to full training uh, with that cohort of athletes relatively quickly with myofascial injuries, one to three weeks, four to eight weeks with muscular tenderness, but significantly longer with tenderness injuries, you know, 10 to 16 weeks. But I think that's just a measure of when you think they're ready to go back, and actually the real measure of whether they were ready to go back is whether they get injured again. Uh, very low injury, re-injury rates in myofascial injuries, a little bit more in muscular tenderness injuries, but in our athletes, that was a, that was a, a real shock. 60% of those athletes were getting injured despite longer times to return to play. So that's where we really wanted to target our strategy. So some pitfalls in, um, in practice. Um, relatively low sensitivity of ultrasound versus MRI. Uh, we, we would make mistakes or we would see other people make mistakes 
where they're just depending on the ultrasound scan for their initial diagnosis. It's so important to get that diagnosis right at the beginning so you don't miss that tendon injury and, and end up with an athlete that keeps having failed rehab because you lose the confidence of the athlete. Um, so uh, ultrasound, can, ultrasound scan can uh, miss a tendon injury. So we felt that an MRI scan was justified in our elite sport population. Again, proximal hamstring injuries when the athlete points to their you know, posterior hip uh, and you feel that it might be a, a mid-belly hamstring. Again, a lot of those can be associated with a tendon injury, so have a high index of suspicion. And even if it looks normal first time, you know, really do check that tendon because I think that's the answer to a lot of these the problems that we get. Um, I know this is posterior hip, but I'm going to put this anyway. The other pitfall is that long head and short head of biceps more distally. It can present with really minor uh, symptoms and signs, but again, can have a high re-injury rate and, and uh, difficult to predict prognosis. And actually, even with our classification, I think you have to really look with a fine tooth comb sometimes just to see if there was a tenderness injury uh, when, when you get your recurrences. Uh, fourth pitfall, uh, significant ten tendon injuries can present mildly. So if you think about your, um, your conjoined tendon, you know, and say the injury is a little bit further down the conjoined tendon, you've got a seven centimeters of tendon before the injury, and you've got a lot of contractile tissue still able to pull on, on, uh, pull on that tendon, so they can have preservation of strength. And if there is a you know, significant injury to the tendon lower down, and just maybe a few fibers or gone completely, uh, then they might, might not have a lot of pain. So the athlete can actually feel uh, relatively little pain, get good range, feel strong, and they think, why are you holding them back? And actually, you know, again, this is where, you, where teams that work with athletes regularly uh, need to build the confidence of both the athlete and the coach when you, when you come up with a decision that this is going to take longer. Another pitfall, obviously related, is that too rapid progression before that tendon has healed. And um, so that's what, uh, in contrast, we actually would use MRI scans serially in our athletes with tendon injuries, particularly when there's a, a grade four intramuscular tendon injury, because we want to know that that tendon is in that position before you start to uh, push the uh, rehabilitation into some more eccentrics. And again, we'd leave our running, particularly our fast running, which depends on a lot of elasticity of that tendon structure till late on because it does take time for it to develop um, those qualities. <coughs> Rehabilitation. Um, I work with, have worked with a lot of physiotherapists, osteopaths, personal trainers, coaches, uh, strength and conditioning people, or everyone who thinks they can uh, rehab a hamstring and probably can rehab a hamstring better than I can. Um, and so, you know, I, I understand there's lots of different styles. I, mean, I think uh, with, that, with those different styles, I think it's okay to go with whatever is the preference of that partic particular uh, rehabilitation specialist. But there will be certain principles where you actually go, right, this is stand like, stand like a rock. Um, so I think with the myofascial, you can go for fast progression, they can, they can run early. Uh, with muscle tenderness, I think that's more dependent on uh, the, the uh, want of the particular rehabilitation specialist because it still has relatively low re-injury rates. But with the tenderness ones, again, that slow progression, avoid the eccentrics early on, uh, avoid that high, high speed running, and really have that risk-based discussion with both the athlete and the coach to understand that if they're going to push things, that there is a risk of injury. And we were able to have those conversations with a bit more context than we were before the classification. So we said, well, if you go back at two months, you've got a 70, 80% chance of, of a re-injury. Go back at three months, it might be 50. If you leave it to four months, then it's almost down to zero. And actually, that's, that's quite strong, especially if you're going, these are on our athletes and our sprinters. Uh, return to full training criteria. I think it can be, again, it can be a little bit looser with the lower grade injuries, so clinical tests and functional tests. Uh, add in strength tests for muscular tenderness. But for tenderness uh, uh, injuries, then you, know, you, you try and do as many tests as you possibly can before you get them back. We don't use GPS in athletics, uh, but it's probably something that we would have loved to, loved to have done. So in summary, uh, style in rehabilitation is fine, but you've got to be guided by your principles, and you've got to get the diagnosis right first time. In particular, don't miss your C injuries. You can progress the A injuries 
reasonably quickly, but the C injuries are high risk and don't be fooled by low symptoms. Be aware of the potential for underdiagnosis with ultrasound scan, and so consider MRI scan where you have any suspicion, uh, slower steady progression in Cs, and more stringent return to play criteria. Thank you very much. Can we please take any questions from the audience? There are some microphones um, available. So explain a bit about what the exact anatomy of the central tendon is. Uh, the anatomy of central tendon. The central tendon, when we talk about the central tendon, is when we consider uh, the tendon between uh, biceps femoral, long head, and semitendinosus, okay? It's similar like a septum in rectus femoris, okay? It's an intratendinous. Uh, and if we talk about that, we can consider that it's a, a myotendinous junction as well. But we consider in hamstrings that it's really, and when you do surgery, you find that really it's a real tendon inside the muscle. And, and these injuries, how they, they describe the last speaker, uh, they need more time in recovering time. It's not a, a simple muscle injury. So, so, so basically, anatomy-wise, you, you, you are referring to the, the bit of the semitendinosis and bias femoris a few centimeters away from the insertion where the tendon disappears yes. into the intramuscular. Yes, it's more uh, from the biceps femoris because the, the semitendinosus, when uh, it attaches in the ischium, it's, uh, it's not a, a real tendon. It's more fibers that they arrive up and, and, and attach. And the real tendon always, in general, it's a semi, it's a, it's a biceps femoral. And then when you open and, and you look for the, the surgery, in general, the, the main tendon is the biceps femoris. If who is losing tension is the biceps femoris. And then you make anatomical uh, suture to the tendon that beside you have the semitendinosus, and then you put an anchor in the ischium bone, and, and, and you are going and you are going down with the suture to reinforce this this uh, anatomical restoration. Hi, um, Marcus Banks here. Um, I, this is a question really to uh, to Vikas and Giles. Can you describe the typical patient profile of someone who benefits from a deep posterior space endoscopy? In my large experience of 32 and 10 years, uh, the typical 32 patient- 32 more than me. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, um, I'll go back to actually Hal Martin, who's, uh, who's probably the guru of deep gluteal syndrome. And most of my understanding actually comes from him and seeing patients in his clinic. So the classical patient who benefits from this is a chap who's got uh, a negative intra-articular, I'm going on to investigations yeah. directly, a negative intra-articular injection that you've done. So he's not benefited from that. <laughs> Symptoms and signs are classical for uh, deep gluteal syndrome as described, both sensitivity and specificity. You've tried conservative measures for three months in terms of piriformis uh, stretches and you are a good endoscopist and can s and can actually endoscope that area properly. If you're not, then you should be doing it open. So that's the typical profile who would actually benefit from this. And as a surgeon, you need to know to dissect the nerve appropriately, to release it both top and bottom, almost like the cubital tunnel syndrome in the elbow, and release the piriformis muscle as well. So can I further that question then, Vika? So the, you talked very clearly about <laughs> the clinical findings in these different syndromes. How much do you rely on subsequent radiology to confirm or refute diagnostically? If, if you're talking about a percentage, uh, I would say 75% of my diagnosis is made clinically and 25% is made on investigations. So on investigations, I'm looking at a decreased distance for the ischiofemoral impingement, a negative um, intra-articular injection test, so you know that it's coming from the posterior space, or any other specific reason as to why you may have a sciatic nerve entrapment, a tumor, a vascular abnormality, which could actually lead to it. So pretty much most of the diagnosis is on a good history uh, and a good clinical examination. And the more you think about it, the more it's actually staring at you. 
And uh, on the note of issue femoral impingement, so we see many patients who we're investigating for other things who have edema in the issue of femoral space or something that may not be considered to be clinically relevant. How many patients with issue of femoral impingement syndromes will have anatomical causes versus um, functional control issues that are causing edema in the space? So, Cathy, very good question. I don't have, um, I don't have an evidence-based answer to that. We are actually investigating at the moment in terms of the MRI reported reduced distance and patients actually being symptomatic, mm -hmm. and probably about 20% of those patients are symptomatic, but the MRI is showing a reduced distance. So whether anatomy actually correlates to patients being symptomatic, not exactly true. Yeah, I would like to extend on that a little bit. Um, so we, old hipsters here are familiar with clinical graphics. I think we're all using it. Um, um, one of the uh, range of motion test is the hip extension, external rotation, where we see a lot of femoral impingement, but not a lot of symptoms. So, uh, so how can we explain this? I think um, that currently IFI is massively overdiagnosed. Um, talking about clinical graphics, they standardise the plane that the, of the femur. So if the patient has increased femoral neck antiversion, they will rotate it round and give it like and. It, may, it would appear on those reports that the patient has IFI. Even if you look on the MRI, they don't have any signs of it at all and have no symptoms in keeping with it. Um, I think IFI, going back to your question also, is actually can often be treated conservatively with functional changes. Um, and uh, I think, you know, I just point out that it's okay, the female pelvis may well grow over time, but it's something that, you know, why, why would it develop all of a sudden? Um, it's, an, it's an interesting thought. Would, would you use the two MRI scan and, and uh, yeah. motion simulation? I think I, th I think for I wouldn't use I don't use clinical graphics, although I use them obviously all, nearly all my patients. But uh, with regards to motion analysis versus IFI, I think the plane CT is more useful um, because it shows the actual, the, pl the natural plane of the of the of the leg. Um, versus the, the dynamic, which I had a, sl a static slide of on, on mine, um, which I think can be misleading. Because obviously the other thing that clinical graphics do is they standardize the pelvic plane, um, and if the pelvis is actually more naturally forward tilting, it will lead, take the ischium out of the way. But if they, they straighten it up, it will bring it into the plane and suggest your patient may have IFI, which they may not. Um. The, the other point, uh, Ernest, is that if you speak to the guides from clinical graphics, they will clearly tell you that it's not been validated for any soft tissues. It's just a bony collision model which moves in one plane. So for, for diagnosing ischiofemoral impingement, it's not the right diagnostic tool. I, I enjoyed the talks about posterior hip pain, but um, I, I didn't hear from, from any of the speakers. Uh, the, an example which I think is quite often uh, when we see uh, athletes with apophysial avulsions uh, treated conservatively uh, with heterotopic bone ossifications. Um, what is your experience with those patients and, and, who, and how, how do we deal with them, how we diagnose what the issue is and how do we treat them? I'll, uh, I'll contribute to that one, Ernest. Um, and actually, I've got a patient who instantly springs to mind who was a sort of teenager who was a rugby player and he managed to avulse uh, his proximal hamstring with a bit of bone, uh, so he pulled off the apophysis. And of course, everybody was treating him non-operatively, as, as indeed you should. The problem was he went on to develop quite a lot of fibrous adhesion of that and he started to get very... Um, sort of intense sciatic symptoms from that. Um, and so he couldn't actually sit down at all because every time he sat down, he was effectively pressing his, you know, pulled off uh, chunk of bone straight onto his sciatic nerve. And as you might imagine, that's extremely painful. Um, and, and, and of course, with a chronic injury like that, it's very difficult to then go and reoppose that back to where it belongs because everything's so scarred, scarred up and it's very difficult. I mean, I saw him at three years post-injury, so it was really difficult to try and, you know, and go and pull that back. 
And, and in fact, all I did was to remove that bony chunk and do a, a sciatic neurolysis. And he's, he's one of the happiest patients I've ever had because he can then sit down again without any pain. And in terms of his overall function, uh, because everything was, you know, sort of so well healed, um, he didn't lose any strength or anything like that. And he was able to return to performing at a high level as he was previously, but at least he, he lost the pain in the bum that he had. So, so, so you're, are you suggesting that we perhaps should monitor, uh, monitor him a little bit better than we, than we do? Indeed, yeah. I think, um, you know, he's somebody who, if we'd picked him up much earlier, would probably have benefited from early surgery rather than prolonged non-operative treatment. And, and I think the, you know, the, for me, the, the big issue with these particular patients is once they start to get that sciatic irritation, that should be an alarm bell that's ringing because it's very difficult to settle them down non-operatively when it gets to that stage. Uh, a slight subject change. Um, I'm delighted that um, probably still have to raise the good old labral tear in the discussion of any hip pain. So we, we haven't talked much about the influence of posterior labral pathology on the patient who presents with posterior hip symptoms. How relevant do you feel it is? I guess Vikas mentioned the intraarticular injection to rule that out. And um, I think that's something we probably would all use as a diagnostic first step. Do you think that a diagnostic injection um, is extremely reliable in excluding the posterior labrum as a source of pain? I wouldn't say it's extremely reliable, but I think it's um, part of your sort of diagnostic workup. I'll pass over to Giles. Depends on how you do your injection. Um, obviously, ultrasound guide injections do rely very much on the anti inflammatory effect of the steroid um, post injection as a test. All you can do, as Ernest does um, in clinic, I believe, before and after he sees the patients. I do, it in, I do them under quick sedation in theatre with a pre and post injection exam, so you get an on the day differential. The point of that is that you don't put any local anesthetic anywhere except in the joint itself, and so you are doing a pure hip block. Um, and you can examine the patient often and see how the symptoms have changed. And so from that point of view, I think it's extremely helpful. It's sort of a discrete burst as what's traditionally been described, but uh, I get the feeling that actually a lot of these are an underlying tendinopathy or a tear, so there's additional pathology. So we inject the bursa with ultrasound guidance, but actually are we trying to really just sort of minimise symptoms while they do additional rehab for that injury? I guess I the question is: the question is, are, are there really discrete bursae that are without any other pathology around? Uh, so, in my experience, the answer would be no. If you are treating a bursa, you definitely need to get further investigation to make sure that there is no underlying tear there underneath. Secondly, I think uh, the best thing would be to actually group them together as a greater trochanteric pain syndrome. That's the correct diagnosis or the terminology used for this. And an MRI scan is essential for these patients rather than three steroid injections in clinic and you're still struggling. That They keep coming back to you in six weeks' time. And Vikas, how, um, how often in the athlete do we, see, do we think we see gluteal tendinopathy as opposed to lateral hip pain being referred from the joint, specifically in the athlete as opposed to the older person? So again, uh, we've done a study with uh, looking at concomitant pathology on MRI with patients uh, who have FAI, and about 40% of them will have other pathology going on, like trochanteric bursitis or iliopsoas tendinitis, along with FAI as a secondary pathology. But in terms of patients presenting with lateral hip pain as an athlete, um, you know, the balance of diagnostic probabilities in, in athletes who have lateral hip pain being gluteal tendinopathy, many would say would be quite rare as gluteal tendinopathy being the source. I, I would agree because they would have some underlying biochemic, a biomechanical abnormality to produce that gluteal tendinopathy, absolutely. Sorry, just to comment fur further on that. Um, one of the issues um, is that to respond to your question, I don't, I don't think you can get bursitis in isolation, which I think is what you were asking for. 
it, it's always the effect rather than the cause. And, and I think, you know, to Vikas's point, I think, you know, one of the issues we see a lot in athletes is a contracted ITB, as I was mentioning in my talk. And, you know, I see that a lot in runners, a lot in triathletes. And that contracted ITB has other effects. So it can give you the gluteal tendinopathy because of that. It'll give you the bursitis. It'll give you all these other things. But, you know, and you need to understand why they've got the contracted ITB. You know, again, is that the chicken or the egg? And, but, so you need to look at all these things together, and then you need to work out how you're going to rehab them from that. And if you can't rehab them, then you need to think about surgery. Uh, but, I, you know, I think it's important to get it all in the right sequence. I've got a quick question for the uh, rehab in terms of conservative measurement for uh, hamstring. Return to play, what do you say as a safe time for them to come back to the field? So it depends on what the grade of the injury is. And so um, if it's a C injury where there's a tenderness in involvement, then I think you probably, uh, if it goes smoothly, then you're probably safe at four months. But we very rarely get the privilege of that amount of time. Uh, in athletics, um, my previous sport, there's always a, the goal of, of a world championships uh, that make you take shortcuts. And, um, uh, and that's when you have to have your risk-based discussion with the whole team. And the whole team need to be talking. The whole team need to accept that risk. Even though when it goes wrong, it still get blamed. Um, uh, I, th I think we have enough uh, intelligence now in, from, from our data to say that, that we're pr pretty sure about those, t those time frames. Um, the return to play um, decision obviously depends on certain testing that you would do and obviously not looking for reactions uh, with, return, with return to, uh, to running, for example, in athletics. Um, does that answer your question? I, I'd just like to say something else, listen, listening to all these... Can, can, we, can yeah. we just uh, not finish that? Uh, okay. I, I would like to have Jordi come in, and, and I want to ask Jordi another question, uh, which might uh, yeah. be in the interest... In, uh, in, in, hold, on, hold on, Jordi. Yes. So, so what I would like you to ask as well is, is uh, after the hamstring reattachment, to brace or not to brace? Okay. First question, Conservative Friedman. We, we manage uh, when... It depends on the, the player position. For us, it's very important. It's dominant or not dominant leg that is important. And it's important uh, how the, the injury is near to the tendon because and the tissue connective uh, damage, that is very important because the severity, it it's, uh, depends on these three concepts. No? Because sometimes we have had as a central tendon or a tendon abulsion with no dominant leg, and we decide to do conservative treatment. Okay, uh, it's not only one 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 option. We have to consider in general the player, the the leg, and the and the, and, and where is the injury. So this is how we manage. Not use orthotics. We don't like, and in central tendon. We avoid the hip flexion and knee extension the, the first uh, week, and then they start to move it. And we try to, to explain easy for the patient that if he moves flexion, if he, uh, he makes flexion of the hip, make flexion of the knee, 30 degrees, and that's all. And then you can protect all the suture, and we don't, we, we don't have uh, had any problem with uh, this, uh, this protocol of rehabilitation. So when do they come back to play? When do they come back to play? <laughs> we don't use tests of, uh, of a strength. We don't use uh, uh, isokinetics uh, test, and we try to do a return to play very functionally. Okay, the eccentric uh, loads and concentric loads, we, we, we try to do it in the sand, we try to do it in the hill, and we try that the player uh, make adaptation to the real situation that he has to play. Because when we believe, it's a philosophy, that we make a test of the, the strength, it's a static is not the real situation. And the GPS is very useful for us because it's a form to, 
to know because we, we have the, the, the fight profile of all the players. When we have a new players, we are recording all, all, the, the, all the trainings and we know some data that, that the physiotherapists are, are using. When we have an injury player, we know that the normal fit profile is this one. So if we get this fit, uh, this, uh, fit profile with all the tests and the small uh, trainings that the physiotherapist or adaptator makes, it's enough for us to say that it's ready to return to play. This is our philosophy. Thank you. Um, just sticking to uh, rehab, um, do any of you advocate the use of um, muscle stimulators post-surgery, like the Compex muscle stimulator to uh, get muscles activated without loading? Not in my practice. <laughs> Not currently. <laughs> No. I just wonder, because I think Andy Williams has started using them um, post-surgery with quads, and I just wondered whether any of you had thought about using them. We use them a lot. I'm a physiotherapist. We use them quite a lot in our clinic as part of the conservative management, along with dry needling, um, to activate uh, glutes when the neuromuscular patterning isn't working, to really start getting them working. And I just wondered if you'd thought about sticking them on post-surgery. <laughs> Yeah, I, maybe I can comment on that slightly. Uh, um, so, um, a muscle at rest produces myostatins, and myostatins uh, cause sarcopenia. And you can block the, the pathways to the production of, uh, of, of, of myostatins by using electrostimulation. So, um, yeah. I don't want to embark on the faculty, but yeah. <coughs> Any more questions? No? Um, and I thank you very much for attending this session um, and um, hopefully you will join the rest of the conference as well. Thanks.